So afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon Olin, Dev Black Ops on Twitter. Um, this session is about developing with PowerShell classes and here be dragons. And this, what this really means is, what are some of the gotchas that you're more than likely going to find, or at least these are all the things that I found when working with classes and, and developing with them and creating modules with them. So hopefully this is useful to you, and this will help guide you when you actually, if you do start using them, what not to do, or you know, if you if you do like pain and suffering, go ahead. Um, th these links go to Speaker Deck and to the GitHub repo um, for these for these demos. The slide, this is like five slides, so it's useless. Um, but the, the GitHub repo will have all the demo code that I have here. So here's our agenda. Um, what are PowerShell classes? Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of what they are. This session is not really about how to write classes. Um, if you went to Jeremy's session about um, his info blocks right there, he did a good overview of uh, more in depth about classes themselves and what you can do with them. Um, this is more about, okay, after you've decided to use them and you have them, what are the, the headaches you're probably going to run into importing them, sharing them with other modules and all that kind of stuff. Um, so hopefully th these kind of tie, I think, pretty well together. Um, I'll go over a little bit about why you would use classes. Um, uh, and really the bulk of this is all these gotchas, and th there's a few more of these about what you're probably, gonna, probably uh, going to encounter. And then hopefully we got a little time for Q&A at the end. So here's an example or two examples of, of what a, a really basic class is. On the left hand side you see we have a, a class that defines what a car will look like and a couple of basic properties about that car, manufacturer, model, and year, and a method um, that operates on that class called drive and it uh, obviously you know does what it says it does. Um, and at the very bottom is how you would instantiate that class with, with the new method, or the, the one of the ways you can do this. On the right-hand side is a little bit more advanced stuff where you can do with classes, and this is where you actually start getting more of the benefit of using them is code reuse, is I want to create a new class called a Tesla. And obviously, it's gonna inherit a lot of the properties from a car class. It's also gonna define a couple new ones, max speed, range, and, and so forth. Um, and then we're going to set those when we, when we uh, on the default constructor on, constructor on this class, we're going to set the, some properties on it. Um, this is just really a basic example of what you would do with a class. Um, but why would you want to actually use classes? Um, I kind of think of it as once you start using PowerShell to create applications versus admin scripts that are pretty, pretty linear, um, you start, you're starting to morph into the realm of development, and you start um, needing to think about some of these more developer type terms. I'm not a developer. I've just, I've, I know a little C sharp. I know some JavaScript. Um, I hate it. Um, <coughs> uh, I didn't go to college. I'm a, I didn't go to college. I'm a dumb marine. So, um, yeah. Um, I've just learned this stuff my trial, trial and error, and and sheer force of will. Um, but the main reasons you would use a class is separation of concerns. You want to you want this instance of a class to do one thing. Another class has a different separate set of concerns. It, op, it does something entirely differently. You don't want these code this code to bleed into each other. And this is really about just code reuse and keeping things tidy and orderly. And this is much more uh, important when you start developing big applications. You need to cordon off what these things do from each other. That's it for the slides. So, demo is really about, um, now, now you know everything you need to know about how to use a class, right? Okay. I'm gonna run through, hopefully I have time to run through these 12 scenarios about classes. Um, and, and this intentionally shows you a lot of red. And this is A, to hide my errors and, and to fool you. But this is really uh, to show you what you're probably going to see once you start using classes and try to work with them. This is the stuff you're going to see and how to work around them. So the first scenario here is we all know what import module does, imports modules. 
let's say I have a class in a module. Let's look at this, uh, this my class. Very basic module, has a manifest, nothing special there. Nothing special really in the PSM1. It has a class called foo. We want to use that class in our PowerShell session. Well, you would think we've all done this. We want to use a function or something of a, of a module. We import the module and expect that to work. Do you think that's, you think that's going to work? Yeah. Can't type. No, of course it doesn't work. Unable to find type foo. Um, why is that? Does, does anyone actually know that the true reason why that doesn't work? Um, I actually don't know the true technical reason. If Bruce Pyatt was in here, he'd probably tell me why. Um, <laughs> I just know it doesn't export the class. Um, if you actually dig into the PowerShell code for um, import module and using module, this, you'll probably find out why that is. But the, the gist of it is, classes, the raw class is, and type is not exposed when you import the module. So. How do we work around that? You're stealing my thunder. <laughs> Using class, which was introduced in uh, PowerShell 5, um, is how, or using module, I should say, is how you would use a module uh, with the class in it. Um, let's run, let's see what this does. And this is a, a, and there's all kinds of gotchas with using module, and I'll go over some of them. So, but this worked. This, this is how you would use a module. It'll import the module and expose that class to your session. And now I have access to the, the raw um, class type and I can instantiate an instance of it. And you can see that it, it did actually import the my class module. So, great, right? You think that, okay, using module is the answer for all of this. No. <laughs> uh, this is, and this is how you were using it in uh, Infobox module is you can hide all your classes in, uh, internally to the module and expose them with uh, just normal PowerShell um, functions or commandlets. Let's see what this does. So actually, let's, uh, let's look at this car module. <clears throat> This is what I tend to do with my modules, is I, I like to break them up into small little pieces. I have public and private and classes and separate files. And I think most people do that probably now. Is that true? Yeah. I like to be tidy. I don't like a 10,000 line PSM1. Um, let's see if this works. So I have a class folder. I have a simple class called car that's in that. My PSM1 dot sources that class file when it imports, and then I have a a normal PowerShell function that uh, will create a, an instance of that car, set some properties, and then return it. And so this is, oops, this is my, um, this new car function is my way of, in, of interacting with, with this, uh, this class. So you can see that worked. I imported the module. Um, I created a new class, a new, I should say an instance of a class. Do a get member, I can see. It's, it's car, I can do everything I want. This is a normal PowerShell object at this point. Oops, because I didn't script scope it. You can see that, I can then pipe that and format list, format table, whatever you want to do with that, like any other object. So. That gets around one problem with classes not being exposed from a module is you basically expose them with a function, which means you also have to write new function or you have to create a function that new, new something to create an instance of your class and give it back to you. These, these, uh, these scenarios kind of go in order of complexity. So here's a, here's a, a, a gnarly one. So, 
let's say I have, so I have a, a car class, and I have a Tesla, or a car module and a Tesla module. This Tesla module is completely separate from the car, but I want to extend the car for whatever reason. I have this, someone exposed this, created this really nice class, I want to be able to use it in my stuff, in my own module, I want to be able to inherit from it. Can you do that? Um, let's actually just put these in my path real quick. So I'm going to import Tesla and it doesn't work. And why is that? Anyone have a guess? You're still, I'm, that's skipping ahead. <laughs> this is how you would normally define a dependency in a module, right? In a manifest, do you require modules? I have that, I require the module, why didn't it work? It should have imported car before it loaded Tesla. What's that? Yeah, no idea. Just saying, it's the same problem as import module, because internally to PowerShell required modules is probably just running import module or some variation of it. So you run into the same issue, and this theme of all these things. This is a lot of these things stem from that core problem right there. So the dragon in this is that, yeah, required modules does not expose the classes, just like import module does. Same problem as uh, scenario one. Um, and you also find with developing with classes, at least I, I'll be setting up a class and, and tweaking it, and I, oftentimes I get in a weird state and I just end up restarting my session. just to, to make everything sane. So let's add, hello. So we'll fix the Tesla module. So we had a hard, all right, so let's, so we had a hard dependency on the, on the car module with the required modules in the manifest. So let's remove that, because we know that that doesn't work. So let's comment this out. And inside, and we'll create a soft dependency, um, and you really shouldn't do this. But, but so now inside, when I import that module, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume the car is already on the machine, and I, I have to assume that here. And there's other issues with doing this. Now, things like PS Gallery and stuff, you try to publish these to the, mod, to the PowerShell Gallery, you're not telling the gallery that you have a dependency on this other module. That's completely hidden from those. From those. It requires, I don't know. I don't know if that'll work. Let's see, Let's see if I have time to test that. Um, so I think I had that already. Double check. So let's try to import now. It doesn't work. Anyone have a clue why? I'm using it using module. I have it at the, as the first executable thing in, in my script, and that's also another requirement with using module. No? Let's go back to the car. I dot sourced it. So classes aren't exposed, even with using module, if they're dot sourced from the PSM1. They have to be in the PSM1. And that sucks, because I don't like 10,000 line PSM1 files. But we got to do what we got to do. So let's take, let's just pull this out of there and let's stick it in here. And let's try this again. So save, save, save. <coughs> it works. So now I can do new car, new Tesla. And there you go. But that sucks, you know. It's problematic. I don't have. I've no. I don't. I no longer have a hard dependency on the car module. It's dangerous for me to publish this because someone else pulling it down is not going to get that dependency. And again, it's the same core problem: is that classes and using module, they need to be in the PSM one, not dot sourced. So let's try this a different way. Let's try to create to have a hard dependency on the module with required modules, and use a class 
in the PSM. Well, actually, that's what I did right there. So we have a hard dependency in required mod. Oh, no, sorry. Let's put that back. Car, the car module is now correct. The class is in the PSM1. Let's take this using module out and do this how we think it should work. Anyone know why this mini pace is like really slow? Does anyone see that? Mm -hmm. Anyone have that too? Yeah. I usually only see that in the, in the integrated window. Yeah. It doesn't work. So this is what we would think we would need to do is have the required in the, the uh, um, required modules. Again, the core problem is that required modules is not running using module under the covers. It's using import module, and we already know that doesn't, that doesn't work. So no joy. Required modules is not using using module. <clears throat> Soft dependency on car module, so we already did that one, I believe. Yes, we did. Yeah, this works. It's yuck, you know, yuck though. Um, like I said, things like PowerShell Gallery, we won't, won't know about this dependency. If you try to import it, you're, you have to assume that that person has, already has that dependent module on the box, and that's not good. And everyone clear on, on that? That's a kind of a, a long set of scenarios there. I should say, is anyone not clear? So. Let's go, let's uh, restart this just in case. So, we have classes, uh, Tesla and car, and I want to import this thing. Let's just, and let's just dot source this and see if it works. Is it gonna work? No, of course it's not. Um, normally, you know, functions, PowerShell functions, you can write them in any order. You know, it, the PowerShell is gonna parse the whole thing before it, it does um, anything with them. Not so with classes. Order matters. So let's fix that. And there you go, that works. Um, this is a, a real pain in the butt once you have a fairly advanced module and lots of classes and you need the, and the things depend on each other and you need to order them such. So. I don't know. Um, I, I know someone that I've worked with on a, a, a way to, to kind of like recursively try to import classes and then eventually it'll, it'll work. Yeah, just keep on going until you've run out of exceptions. Um, and that actually does work, but that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or um, I told them, I was like, you could probably use like the abstract syntax tree and, and parse this stuff and then do a bunch of magic on your own to parse all these files, come up with a, a graph of things to import, and then import them. I don't even think you can get to the ASP without, like it tries to compile. Oh, does it? I haven't even tried it, so, okay. Nice. Okay, so don't do that. <laughs> so, this is not really a, a dragon. This is really just an FYI with, with classes. Um, you wanna hide properties from a class. Maybe they're, they're internal to the, the, um, to the class. You don't want people to muck with them. Um, but, you know, hidden, so you do that with this hidden keyword on a, on a property. And so we have a class, let's, uh, let's create a new instance of it. So we have our name property, it's public. We don't see our secret in our super secret password hunter two. Um, but we can always get to this if we really want to with force. And we can see the secret property there. You can also see a bunch of other methods that PowerShell has created for you on this class and get and set. And this is internally how these properties are being set. So can I actually see that uh, secret? One thing it, it does, does not do is give you uh, tab completion on these. So if I do F dot, and I hit tab, I should tab expand this and see this property like you would normally expect. Hidden properties don't do that. 
So you have to know what you're looking for, and you can see it. And you can also set it, of course. This is not a locked property. So don't use this if you're don't use this to store secrets that you're you're thinking that you're going to hide from people. Um, if people, you know, and this is the same in C sharp, you know, hidden properties are not meant to hide things. They're meant to tell people not to use them. They're internal to the class and their implementation details of the class are like private APIs, um, and you it's you run the risk of breaking things when you try to use internal things because it's on them to change them. You get, they give you public properties to use. Don't use the internal ones because they're free to change them. So that, that's really the kind of the gist of hidden properties. Not to hide secrets from you, just to tell the developer or the user, this is stuff that you don't, this is just inside baseball stuff, don't use it. So not really a dragon, but you know, they're, they're not private and even private in C Sharp is not really private. Uh, you can still get to them. It's just hidden and not very well. I do on that time. Okay. Uh, verbose in debug. Um, this is not really also a dragon, but this is just another stuff that be F to, as more of an FYI about working with classes. Um, I got this, this demo class from a fellow on, on Stack Overflow. But this just kind of gives you a nice rundown of how verbose and debug work inside classes. So let's, let's, uh, let's import this. So we have a class and then two functions. So inside these functions, we have a, a normal function. It's gonna create a new instance of that class, run a method on it, pretty, pretty simple. And we have an advanced function with command and binding that uh, gives us our, our verbose and debug and what if and all that kind of fun stuff. All the stuff we should be using for every single function we write, right? Right. I don't, I don't see any reason not to use advanced functions personally. They, get, they just give you a lot of stuff for free. That works just like we would expect it. We create a new instance, pass it a property. Let's try the advanced verbose. You know, works like we would expect it to. You can see our, my verbose messages in my in my uh, constructor and in my method. Debug should work the same way, right? And it appears to. It ran my debug message right there. So that's cool. But, there's always a but. Well, actually, this works. So we'll just, uh, we'll set our, we'll just manually set our verbose preference uh, in our session. So we're not gonna wrap it around a function. And we'll create a new instance. I don't have verbose turned on. I shouldn't expect any output, and that's, that's correct. Let's turn it on and run it again. We get our verbose message like we'd expect. Does debug work? They worked in the function. So we'll set it to inquire. This will also work with, oh, I should say not work with continue. Where's my debug message? The debug is turned on. Verbose seemed to work, not, oh, not debug. Does anyone know why or have seen this? Because I don't know the answer. I think this is a bug. Well, so does Verbose. They're, they're both in separate streams. Um, well, I mean, if we do continue, it won't do that, right? No, I don't see it. So, I think this is a bug. Um, I'm just curious if anyone else has seen this. I'll probably raise this, but to me, I, that should work just like verbose. So that is a potential gotcha if you want to manually work these classes and you want to turn on debug. You got to wrap it in a function and that sucks for debugging purposes. Uh, 
All right, so <coughs> requires. How many people use a requires module? Okay, some people. I personally don't use it. I think there's some problems with it. Um, this is just yet another one of them. And I'll show you why. Oh, don't do that. Um, so requires at the beginning. Um, let me run this in my session. Make sure I'm all fresh. Requires also does not import the module correctly. Using module is the only way to do this. That sucks. So requires not, not going to happen. Let's use that. Let's uh, do that. That worked. I should dot source this. And I got my got my instance. So using module, don't use it if you want to use work with directly with classes. It's not going to work. Same problem as one in what scenario four or something like that. Um, the other problem with requires modules is that it tends to swallow exceptions. If you're trying to import a module and that module doesn't, it fails to import and it's throwing errors, your script, um, you're not going to see the actual reason why that module didn't import. It's hiding stuff from you. So it, it, it can lead to uh, some debugging pain if you try to use requires. Right, so requires doesn't import classes. So run me first again. Refresh. So I have two mo uh, um, a module here called fruit, two versions of it, one and two. These don't do anything particularly special. They have a couple classes in there about you know a fruit-based class and an apple that extends it. And then I got version two. The only real difference between these is um, I think version two added like calories as a property. Let's close that. Okay. So I should be able to see them here. So I added that. I can see version one and two. That's great. All using module, because we know that's the correct way to do these things. I'm going to import fruit, but hey, I got two versions of it. Which one did I import? I imported version two, the latest, like you would expect if you didn't specify a version and you have multiple versions on the machine. It's going to import the, um, the latest. What if I want to import an older one? What's going to happen? You think that's going to work? Of course not. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's a theme here, right? So, I got that, I got that. So, um, anyone know what module spe specifications are? Where you can, you can basically have a hash table of the name and the version, and you can use this with import module, and just give it that hash table to import that specific one. Do you think that would work? It, it, it does, kind of. It imported the module correctly, why is this here? I, I said version two. What version did it, you think it actually loaded? Oh, well, sorry. I wanted version one. Why is version two here? <laughs> Strike that, reverse it. Oh, I restarted my session, didn't I? Did I? Okay. Why do I have two? Why did two get loaded? Hmm? I don't know. I told it one. <laughs> Uh, no, I told it one. I want one. This is the module specification. I don't. It's, it's giving you a specific version to import. Did you say two when it one? No, <laughs> it'll learn. It'll load the latest always. Yeah. So that's not cool. Why the latest version? 
I think this is also a bug. I got to do some more investigation, try to figure out some other edge cases to see why this is working this way. But module specifications don't work. They don't appear to work anyway. Not the way you, you would think. So what's the, so let's look at a more complex module. Um, fittingly named complex module. So, and this is when I write modules, this is how our, my common structure and probably most of it, you know, a lot of people here is public and private and maybe classes if you have one, you got your, your manifest and PSM1 and your PSM1 does dot source and stuff. Or, you know, maybe does a couple of initialization, initialization stuff. So. Um, I have a build uh, script that um, just kicks off Saki. Anyone not know what Saki is? Okay, it's, it's a build, uh, it's a task framework, um, kind of like make, rake, bake. I think there's a bake. There's, a, there's one of these for every, pretty much every language and they always sound like ache, except for Saki because PS ache is odd sounding. And Saki sounds cooler. Um, but it's, it's a build automation uh, framework where you can set up tasks and dependencies. So you have to, you know, usually for compiling code, um, I use it for other things as well. Um, as a side, I am, I am as, as of about six months ago, I'm now the maintainer of Saki. Um, it's gone through a couple maintainers over the years. I'm the current Thread Pirate Roberts, um, for now anyway. Um, and if you're interested in, in Saki, you can hit me up after this. Um, but I have a build script that this is going to run Saki, and I can look at my Saki task. Uh, I'm not going to go over too much of this, but basically, I have a task to clean my output folder, just wipe everything. I have a task to compile the module. You know, we're not really compiling stuff in PowerShell, but really, what I'm doing here is just gathering up all these source files and just shoving them into a PSM1, just concatenating them all, because we we know we saw from other scenarios. Um, classes need to be in the PSM1. I hate having a giant PSM1. I want to keep everything in source separated. So when I build my module, I just load up everything and put it in the PSM1 at build time. The other caveat to this, so oh, I should say, these are my classes. Um, we have a planet base class. We have Mars and Earth. They inherit from planet. Um, we know that order matters. So the order in which you concatenate them in the PSM1 also matters. Um, and this is pretty simple with three classes, but um, like my, my PostSquat module, which I, I'll talk about on Thursday, has like 30 and different dependencies on different ones. And initially, what I was thinking was, oh, well, I'll just order them 01, 02, 03, and I'll just sort them and concatenate them in order. And that just like, I was like, oh my God, this is just like basic and go to 10 and 20 and 30 and then I want to insert a 15 and you know, what if I have 01 and 02 and then I need to put one in the middle and 01.5 and I was like, well, this is just stupid. So I quickly decided not to depend on the file names to order these. I'm just brute forcing it. I just define them in the order that I know that they're going to import. Um, it works, you know, for, for my case. Um, but we have a module, or a, sorry, an array of files. We're going to concatenate them and just add them to a PSM1 file. So we do the same thing with our private and public functions. These don't, the order of these don't matter. Um, just like normal PowerShell. So let's see what this, what this does. So I created a bin folder, the version of the module I'm working with. I got my manifest, and I got my, my nice big PSM1. Now, in my PostScript module, this is like 8,000 lines. So. so this is my, this is my um, way of solving um, some of these problems with modules, is just some of it's just brute force. Yeah. The order of them. That's kind of like the problem he was talking about. Is like um, 
that my, my solution or potential solution was maybe looking at AST and inspecting these files to figure out what depends on what, what and, and create a dependency graph of the order at run, at, you know, dynamically. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It works. Yeah. A lot of the stuff is, it works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, while the work of Agile that we just spoke of is done on time, which is why I wanted to hear from AST. Yeah. They, they does suck. Yeah, I, I have a, th thanks for that. I, I've, I've looked at some of the PowerShell um, code for the using and, I, and I, I know that parse time thing. I didn't know the technical reasons on why it's different and why classes aren't exposed. That's another, I haven't got a ex good explanation about why that's the case and why using modules needed in the first place. Yeah, some custom loader, you know, or I mean, but ideally this stuff is handed in PowerShell itself. That, that's really the end, at the end. Uh, this is really just trying to highlight um, issues that I find with these. So, and I already know the classes are not, they're not 100% when we, they got added to five, and I don't think they've really changed in six. Um, I don't know what the roadmap is on classes and what is, what they're gonna fix. All right, so I got a few, few more minutes here. Let me, um, so that's my compiled module. That's how I do it, is I just mainly create a, a big monolithic PSM1, and I ship it. But same problems with using module apply in that case. You have to use using module if you wanna get access to those raw uh, classes dire you know, directly. So th these two are a little extra I to see if I had time, and I do. Um, classes, so <clears throat> um, anyone know what an abstract, or not know what an abstract class is in PowerShell, or in, I should say in C-sharp? Um, the, the gist of it is is that, um, let's see if I got an example right here. Um, I, and I'm not a developer, so this is my layman's term, is a, an abstract class is a, is not a thing that you actually create. You don't create an instance of an animal. That doesn't make any sense. You create an instance of a cat and a dog. Those are subtypes of an animal. It makes no logical sense to, to, to create an animal. Right, that's what an abstract class is. It's a lot of base functionality that you would then did, you would share in subsequent classes, but it makes no logical sense to create that base class. Things would inherit from it. So that's, that's my layman's term for what a, a, an abstract class is. Regardless, PowerShell doesn't support them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you, can, you can create a, 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 a janky version of it. Um, so let's create an animal class. Okay. So we have an animal class. So here is a way to, uh, and this is a runtime thing, this is not a compile time thing. I say, hey, when, if I try, ever try to create an instance of an animal, don't allow me. It's gonna, I'm gonna throw an error. If when, I, when the animal class gets instantiated and this constructor gets, this constructor gets run, I'm gonna find out what my current type is, and I say, well, if it's animal, don't do this. This is mimicking a little bit of the behavior of an abstract class, is that in, in, in C Sharp, you wouldn't be able to, this would be a compile time error if you try to create an instance of it. This is a runtime check, though. So. Let's create, let's create an, another class that uh, inherits from animal, and we can obviously create a, well, let's try to create an animal. No, we can't. My error says, no, animal's invalid, you have to inherit. Can I create a cow? 
Yes, I can. Can I make it moo? Yes, I can. So that's, that's, a, that's a way to mimic abstract classes. Uh, interfaces, I don't know if, if there's a way to do that in, in PowerShell. So you can mimic them sort of if you want to do this. It's not strictly needed, but that again, abstract classes are, 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 are things that you, know, you don't actually create or would ever want to create an instance of it themselves. And here's a, um, here's a little bit more about the internals of classes. Um, I have this my class, and I want to pass it a value. And you know, in normal PowerShell and command list and functions, you do parameter validation for string length and you know, matching this regex or something like that. You, how do you do that on a class method? You can't put parameter validation on this parameter that you're passing in. So here's an itch. So I will, I'm not necessarily advocating for this, um, but this is something you can play with. So what this does is uh, relying on some magic PowerShell stuff. And, and here's the link to where I found this. So let's create a new uh, instance. So I got a little homegrown parameter validation here. And why is that working? PowerShell is attempting to cast the string that I passed in, Brandon or BR, to make a new instance of validated name. And when the default valid, the constructor of validated name pass, um, gets created, at that point, it's using the normal parameter validation to set the value of that property. So this is relying on PowerShell's, you know, casting from one type to another to do a little, you know, janky parameter validation directly on classes. I'm not necessarily advocating the way to do this. I would just wrap them in normal PowerShell functions and just do it the normal way. But this is something I just saw that was interesting out there. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always work though. So. This is a string, right? This is a value string. I'm passing string. I expect this thing to be a string. I passed it an integer. Well, integers can get cast to strings when it needs to. PowerShell is going to want to do what it wants to do to help you out. It thinks it's being nice, <laughs> and it's not, you know. OK, so. Um, no, so if I pass a string, it'll just work. It should just work the same. What if you cast it as an instance? Oh, like this? Uh, let's see. Yep, this is the same thing. <laughs> so. I was thinking it was, it was doing like the magic like quotes or it was trying to do like when you have like a... Yeah. yeah. No joy. Can't do it. We can't have nice things. Um, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, we're wrapping up like right now. Okay. For the read, open for questions. Okay. Um, this is you know some of the links that I have, some of my projects that I'm working on. You can see Saki, Poshbot, which I'll talk about later, OVF, Watchmen, my all get rep, get have repo as well. Not? Okay. I'll I'll look at that. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.